What I wanted to talk about uh, is first of all a little bit of personal background, as I said, so that you can orientate your thinking into I'm my trying career. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of the picture in picture. Yeah. Well, that's that'd, that'd be right. We've tried to do that. Let's just move on. Um, and then I'm going to talk about international comparisons. I'm going to talk about the shape of the Australian you know, university research sector. Some recent trends in research practice and policy. Uh, and seeing if there's some evidence for what the future might hold out of all of that. And then some conclusions at the end. Um, it's not going to override. So I need to get rid of that conference recording thing somehow. Anybody know how do we do that? It's a little icon to the right of it. Yeah, that's right. That one? Yeah. That just moves the slide to the next one. move on and uh, hope that it can be solved by a telephone call. Okay, now the reason for 1971 is actually okay, hidden behind that little elsewhere. block in there. I started as a research student in 1971, presentation on computer. Uh, doing a, a Bachelor of Science Honours, then on to a PhD, Correct. then on to postdocs, uh, and then postdocs were in Australia, in the UK and then came back to an academic position and I was appointed as an academic lecturer at the University of Sydney at the age of 30. Now I have children who have followed the same sort of career path and they're well into their 30s and not yet got an academic position. Now I think one of the changes that's occurred over that time frame, and you've all experienced it, uh, is that getting into academic posts these days is a little more time challenging therefore family challenging, therefore all sorts of constraints on your careers are uh, related to the fact that it takes longer to get in, mostly, takes longer to get into academic positions where you can establish some sort of time frame over a research career. So I think that's one difference that you might want to reflect on and I often reflect on it because I, I don't have any answers to that. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of words on what I did during my research career. I was interested in the development of the nervous yep. system. Uh, there's a couple of pictures there you can see, which are not mine. There we go. Hey. Um, interested in development of the nervous system from the point of view of nerve fibres reaching muscle cells in embryonic development, brain cell development. Then I got interested in hearing. And the one picture that is of my own here is the one on the bottom left. Um, with a laser beam hitting the eardrum of a frog. You can't really see it very clearly here. But we this was a, my first experience as a postdoc of bringing physics to biology. And the inter interdisciplinary mix that occurred between myself as a biologist, a physicist and mathematician and an engineer led us to some really fantastic discoveries about how frogs hear. Now you might think that that's not terribly relevant, but I won't go into the physiology of all of this, but it has led to new thinking around how we hear in three dimensions and how you can mimic that using headphones. So, and then the thing on the bottom right was adapting technologies to measure hearing in ad adults and eventually, as shown on the next slide, young children. We were looking at the influence of abnormal pregnancy on infant brain development. The one on the picture on the top left, of course, is the shows the two critical issues, alcohol consumption in pregnancy and smoking, and what that does to the human brain in, in utero. We presume that it might affect it on the top right as well. Um, I then got interested in how, how is that mediated, and it's through ion channels, and, and, and so we got interested in all that sort of stuff and brain activity. If I was doing research now, what would I be interested in? It's an always an interesting question because you may have noticed that my research career, my active research career, stopped in 93. I had 22 years as a, as a researcher, from a student through to when I was a professor and moved on to other things. 22 years. And that's what encaptured my active research career. 
Uh, if I was doing anything now, this is what I'd be into. Because ion channels in membranes of all sorts of cells are critical in all sorts of diseases. And if you can stop those ion channels in their dysfunctional state or interfere with them in their functional state, then you can cure a whole lot of diseases. And I'm actually working with Shin Ho Chung at the ANU, uh, who was in fact my first postdoc supervisor in London. And this is what he does. He does computer modeling of ion channels and so on. So fascinating stuff. And if I had more time, I'd be doing it. What did I do in 93? I became a pro vice chancellor at the University of Queensland. And that got me into the administrative side of academia, academia then to uh, University of New South Wales as deputy vice chancellor. And then an interesting move to Canberra as the inaugural CEO of the NHMRC. So I had responsibility for everything that the NHMRC did, and that goes far beyond just offering research grants. I then, after five years in Canberra and the political scene there, um, I went to be Vice-Chancellor and CEO at the University of New England, and hence my interest in regional universities and so on, and my interest in being here today. But since I left that university in, in the end of 2009, I've then taken on a whole range of other things, which you can see there. Uh, and it's been a fascinating experience to get out of paid employment, as it were, and get into doing a whole lot of other things. Uh, and it's something that I'm really enjoying doing. And uh, so there's something beyond just going through all of that career structure which you can look forward to. Okay, international comparisons. Where does Australia sit in terms of its research and development activity? Now uh, this is a, a graph uh, from the OECD, which shows researchers per thousand of employment on the y-axis against gross domestic expenditure on the x-axis. And here is Australia somewhere there. Oh, sorry. But you saw it in the middle of that, that group. Okay, uh, there are some other graphs coming up shortly. But you saw, perhaps I'll try and go back. Oh, I need to go back too. Just hit the left key on the view Get rid of that. Okay. Okay, terrific. So you see Australia there in the middle, uh, in here, and you can see a whole range of countries sitting in here which we uh, expend a little bit more on, at least on these data at this time frame. And this is about 2008 or 9 data. So we're less than the USA, uh, but there's one country up here, Finland. And then you start to look at others like Denmark and Sweden and the Scandinavian countries become more and more prominent and they are actually smaller than us in terms of their economy. I think it's a fascinating thing. The other elephant in the room, of course, is China down here, which we'll see a bit more of in a moment. In terms of productivity, when you look at publications in the top quartile journals, which are the dark bars on this graph, you start with Switzerland at the top, Sweden, Denmark, ISL, which I can't remember, Netherlands, Norway, Finland, and then Australia. Go down that list and see where USA is. It's down in about the middle of the rank down in here. When you look at it on the basis of per 1,000 inhabitants of a country, this is where Australia claims to be <coughs> punching above its weight, <coughs> as you quite often hear. But put that in the context of Sweden, Denmark, all the Scandinavian countries. They're doing better than Australia, and yet they're smaller in terms of pop rate of population, sorry, rate of publication uh, in terms of their population. And then when you look at it, there's another element out of the OEC data which is, I think, quite fascinating, and that is normalised impact. Now this is citation impact data, and you're all familiar with all of that sort of stuff. A rate of 1 is world average. If you're above world average, you're up the y-axis here. And then across the bottom is the level of international collaboration amongst institutions. And it's interesting. USA has one of the lowest, of all of the developed nations, has one of the lowest levels of collaboration. But their volume is actually quite high. Uh, Australia sits in here. And our level of collaboration, I believe, is too small on an international scale. And again, I would highlight to you what happens with the uh, Scandinavian countries. 
Norway, Belgium, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, Netherlands, all those countries there, smaller than us, or producing about the same as us in, in effect, but the way in which they, they achieve higher impact is because I believe they've got a higher level of collaboration, international collaboration. And I think that sends a message to us in Australia as to how we need to position ourselves in terms of our future research effort. One of the saddest statistics out of the OECD, which is, I think, really quite uh, troubling, uh, is this graph. Now, on the left is a whole list of countries, and you'll spend quite a lot of time going down that list to find Australia, right down the bottom. And this is the percentage of R&D funds that come into a country from abroad as a percentage of business enterprise R&D. We know that Australia's business enterprise R&D is quite low relative to other countries, and the amount of money coming into Australia from other countries to assist that R&D effort is extremely low. We even sit below Turkey. And you go up to that list and you see at the top, Austria, Great Britain, Ireland, Netherlands, Hungary, Switzerland, Czechoslovakia, Sweden, Canada, those countries, Norway, all of those countries are attracting a whole lot of foreign investment in their R&D in business. And Australia doesn't do that. Why? because we don't have a lot of R&D in industry and we don't have a lot of innovation-based industry in this country compared to others. What do we rely on? Iron ore and coal. So I think if iron ore and coal go off the boil, where are we placed in terms of our economy? And we've got to drive, I think we've got to start driving now and predicting for 10 years out what will our economy balance be Will it be similar in terms of iron ore and coal, or will we need some more innovation-led economic development in this country? I think we will. And as a result, we need to be working now to increase the effort of R&D in industry. I'll come back to that a little later. Shape of the university research sector in Australia. You've heard some of this already this morning from Caroline, and I'm going to flick through some of the data which I'd prepared, not knowing that Caroline was going to talk about it. But the first question I have to ask is why do we do research? And this was, this is a paper published from the University on Research Management in Universities, published through the OECD, which resulted from a survey of some 50 odd institutions across the world. And this is the sort of summary which came out of that in terms of why do universities get engaged in doing research? You can read through all of those quotations there and you've heard some of them from Caroline this morning. You yourselves understand that because that's what your universities are dealing with. But the point I want to make is that research in universities in, in effect drives an economy because of the innovation which comes from it. Either in terms of cost savings or in redirecting economic activity or in generating economic activity through innovation and intellectual property. And that's what university research should really be about, and that's what it is. Sustain academic and professional reputation in, knowledge -based, in a knowledge-based economy. Universities have to be strong. And Caroline quite rightly mentioned this morning the issue of the importance of strength of regional universities to their regions. And all of this can be translated into why it is important for regional universities in this country to be strong and active. Now, how do we measure what it, the shape of the university sector? Well, I'm going to mention this topic, which is the university research block grant system in Australia. There are currently six mechanisms by which the government allocates funds to universities for block grants to support research. And these are all formula-driven systems. And the things which go into the formulae include publications, research student graduations, and so on. And you're all familiar with plugging data into forms and spreadsheets and so on to underpin that activity. This is the distribution currently of funding in t on 2011 data, or sorry, 2010 data, I think. can't remember. It's either of those two years, which I, I analysed uh, last year in 2011. So it's 2010 data, and I've rank ordered the amounts of money which are coming into the various universities in terms of block grants. And there are eight dots on the left and a whole lot of dots on the right. Okay? 
Now, I thought I'd identify for you where the run universities sit. Okay, because the run universities, as you've heard and as you know, have a low level of, relatively low level of research activity at the present time. And there was comment this morning about the age of institutions and so on. But this is not necessarily the full story, which I wanted to just explain to you why I think it's, there's a slightly different picture available that we need to look at. And that comes from analysing the ERA data from 2010, which you were all particular, you're probably all familiar with. Uh, and you'll be familiar with the spreadsheet uh, which was published in the Australian within microseconds of the ERA data becoming available. <laughs> uh, and ANU comes out on top, Melbourne, Queensland, New South Wales, Sydney, Western Australia, Adelaide, Monash, and then Macquarie. Very closely related to, to the GO8 in terms of the outcomes on this exercise. And then we went th right through the 40 universities. And I've analysed that data. And what I've shown you here is the number of disciplines at ERA Level 3. Now, Level 3 is world class. Level 4 is above world class and Level 5 is really, really above world class. Okay? Now, if you've got Level 3 and above it identified by discipline, this graph shows you the number of disciplines at ERA Level 3 and above versus block grant funding per university. And you can see where the GO8 fit they've got a heck of a lot of disciplines at level three and above. And they've got a heck of a lot of money to do it with. And they get a heck of a lot of grants and they graduate a heck of a lot of students to generate that funding. Okay? Not surprisingly here, the run universities are in that bottom left-hand corner. Because there's not a lot of money and the, there are publications, rates of publication as a result, which are low at the present time. But again, that's not the full story. This is another analysis of it, and this is proportion of disciplines assessed at ERA level three and above versus block grant funding. Now, what this shows you is that GO8 universities have 80 or about 80% or more of their disciplines are at world class or above. So they are very strong universities, very strong universities. But you can see on the left that there are some lesser than GO8 universities who are equally strong or getting there very, very quickly, in my view. And Macquarie would be one of those universities, for example. And again, the run universities in the bottom left. And I haven't singled them out on this graph because it's a little bit too cluttered at that point. And one way of spreading that out is to actually do this exercise, and that is take the same data but normalise it per thousand staff on both axes. And you can see what happens. The GO8 still are to the right. But look at the number of other universities who have per thousand staff, ERA disciplines per thousand staff, who are performing at about the same level. So Australia's university system is not so dominated, in my view, by the GO8, because we've got a lot of pride to get out of the other universities. And this is where the run universities are at the present time. And the one which is the highest performing of the run universities is, as you know, as you've seen from graphs from Caroline, is UNE. Okay? But the other universities there are potentially universities, I think, that can move up this scale quite rapidly. The other thing we have to remember here is that ERA 2010 was based on publications which finished in 2008. ERA 2012 has publications which finished in 2010. And what's happened in that space of 08 to let's say now, that four year period, there's been enormous change in these universities, uh, in other universities as well, and I would suggest lesser change in the GO8s. So I'm predicting out of 2012, ERA 2012 and perhaps the next exercise after that, we won't see a lot of change amongst the GO8s but we'll see a heck of a lot of change amongst the universities such as your own because there's been a lot of activity since 2008 based on the fact that this mechanism is being introduced to assess Australia's excellence in research. So you can look forward to change in this, but we won't know what direction it's moving until we see the results of 2000 and, 
uh, the exercise in 2012. This is another caveat which I like to throw in. So I think it's a caveat on, on what's going on in universities uh, at the present time and it's something we need to bear in mind. And it, there are issues that arise out of this. Why is it that 37% of all scientific articles published in the last decade have not been cited? How do they get the money to do that stuff if it's not of relevance enough to be cited uh, down the track? That's one question. There's probably many others that we could talk about. Let's move on. Recent trends, evidence for the future. I'm going to talk about these things as quickly as possible to leave as much time for discussion. Research activity, what's the practice in research activity? Trends in communication and publication. Funding, regulation, workforce development, management of research, and then finally, politics. Okay, <clears throat> this is again some data from OECD on measuring innovation. This is a picture of collaboration uh, and co-authorship in research productivity in 1998. So the, the, the size of the circles reflects the amount of activity in terms of publications in whole counts. So the big circle there, of course, is the United States. And the grey lines represent collaboration links between those countries based on uh, authorship of papers. And the thickness of the lines represents the amount of activity in collaboration going on. Okay? What I'd like you to pay attention to is this little circle here in 1998. Keep your eye on that spot. This is 2008. Uh, and you can see the most prominent thing here is growth in size of circles, and particularly in China, but also the thickness of the lines. This is really showing us that there's a lot of more international collaboration going on uh, in that 10 year period, up to 2008, and it's not going to slow down. So that's all based on citation data. I've referred to China. From the, in the period 1999 to 2003 on the left, compared to 2004, 2008 on the right, the number of Chinese leading research partners <coughs> Uh, USA, 16,000 in, in the early period, gone up to 39,000 in the period on the right. Every number on the right is larger than the numbers on the left, for whichever country it might happen to be, including Australia. So China is growing in terms of its research and collaboration. Every other country is also growing in terms of collaboration. Chinese scientists going abroad on the left over a period 2001 to 2008, quite a short period. Look at the number of foreign scientists travelling into China on the right. So again, movement of staff, movement of people, collaborations. The whole exercise is one of people moving around and collaborating more. In Australia, the same thing has been analysed. Uh, this is a report from the NHMRC which shows uh, the number of papers published uh, of one author papers more than one author in the same organisational unit within an institution, more than one academic organisational unit from the same institution, more than one Australian university or institution in more than one country. Okay, so the international collaborations are the lighter green columns on the right. National collaborations are the grey columns and the group collaborations are the, the dark green columns. But you can see there a high level in international collaboration and a very low level of single author papers. So collaboration, even in Australia, is the name of the game. Within institutions, between institutions, and particularly, in my view, uh, growing in terms of international collaboration. Now there's another exercise out of uh, citation analysis which is, I think, very sophisticated and, and somewhat illuminatory. Uh, insofar as uh, this is data which is analysed through co-citation and, and uh, cross-institutional collaboration. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in, on this because I find it difficult to explain, but it looks pretty. <laughs> and what it shows you is when there's co-citation of data plotted on the X and Y axis, you find hotspots of activity. And, what, and those are identified in terms of the core papers uh, in those disciplines, and you see um, discipline areas that have come together um, 
and I'll show you that more in the next slide, but this is activity which is the hotspots of activity, where the most activity is going on. And it's quite spread out in terms of the environment, but quite concentrated uh, in areas like in the bottom right, particle physics and cosmology. So uh, a lot of activity within a confined area there. But up the top left, research on regenerative medicine. This is stem cell research. And you can see amongst all the biologies, you can see a coalescing, coalescing of activity in those sorts of fields of research. And these, this is the hotspot stuff. And then this is a similar analysis which goes to the point of looking at multidisciplinary research. And you can see how chemistry, material science, engineering have all come together and they all probably have the title nanoscience in the title of the paper. And those are the aggregations of disciplines coming together. Why is this important? Because it's consistent with collaboration. The advances in science that are going on at the moment are all really around collaboration and bringing people with different disciplines together to, to solve problems. And I mentioned my own experience as a lowly short pants postdoc in London meeting up with a physicist and an engineer and we solved some big problems around how do frogs hear directionally because the wavelength of their sound waves are this long and their heads this wide. There's a physics in there which makes it complicated for frogs to locate a sound, but they do it very effectively, and we found out why and how. And that's because we use physics with engineering with biology to solve that problem. And that's what's going on now. So in, in your networks, and you talked about mapping earlier, that's absolutely crucial because in that mapping exercise, you'll find people working in similar areas to your own. But think outside that square and see what else other people are doing which can actually have an impact on your particular area or your group's area of research. We did that at UNE by combining the faculties of arts and the faculties of science to find a faculty of arts and science. And what happened was that the historians suddenly realised that in terms of environment and water, history had a role to play. So that coalescing, I think, has been quite a stimulus to activity on that university campus. Communication and sharing. This is something which I think is emerging and is going to be more and more dominant in, our, in the research sector. Just recently, the Wellcome Trust is backing open access scholarship. This is open access publishing. And the NHMRC supports it and the IRC support it. And what this means is that there's a growing avoidance of publications which involve restrictions on a publications being read by the profit profitability of journals and the costs involved in that sort of exercise. And with the growing internet and all of that sort of stuff, this is something which is going to be challenging the system down the track and it's something which I think is high on the agenda at the present time. And it's all about sharing of information and sharing of publicly funded information. That's why NHMRC and ARC are onto this simply because it's your taxpayers' dollars which have funded the research and it should be open access and not restricted in terms of who can get access to read that information. This is a real international exercise and it's something which is crucial to the future, it's something that you need to pay attention to as a set of universities. <coughs> there's another issue, before I leave publications, another issue I wanted to point out and that is that there's an undercurrent continually an undercurrent of the relevance of research activity in universities. We saw it most recently with Andrew Robb's comments. We've seen it in, the, in when the current Labor government was in opposition. They quizzed the, the, op, the current opposition government, sorry, the current opposition when it was in government about some of the grants that were funded because they didn't understand what they were about. That's a small, e small issue compared to this one, which is an article written by Peter Shergold. Peter Shergold used to be the head of the Prime Minister's Department for John Howard. And he left the public service and took up a role in social uh, impact and social innovation centres. And he reflected on his activities when he was in the public service. And this is a quote. I've come across many academics who tell me that they are working in areas of public policy of the utmost importance. Healthcare, housing need, workforce participation, etc. 
and yet they shuffle uncomfortably when I ask exactly what policy changes they would introduce to address the problems which they have so carefully analysed. So in terms of the research which is conducted, there are questions, I think, that people need to ask themselves about relevance and practicality of what can actually be translated out of that research. And so, and I think that's critically important for the reasons that Caroline explained this morning. The regional universities have a role to play in their regions to address regionally specific questions. And all I'm encouraging here is that people think deeply about the questions they're asking and the approaches that they're taking to answer them and what the long-term consequences of that research can actually be. And I think that's something that you need to think about for the future because there's this undercurrent of suspicion on relevance and I think it's something which we as academics really need to pay attention to. Infrastructure and sharing. <coughs> infrastructure in Europe has been around for a long time. Infra sorry, infrastructure sharing has been around in Europe for a long time. They formed European organisations, the European uh, Organisation for Nuclear Research, Space Agency, Southern Observatory, etc. You can see them all there. They get together and they share resources because they're close to each other and they can see the benefit of doing it. In Australia it's a little more difficult to share because we're so far away. But we've done it more in this country in the last few years than we've ever done before. In 2006 the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy was there and last year it's been revised and updated and it's now the strategic roadmap for Australian research infrastructure. What this is all about is the government ensuring that its resources are available for sharing across uh, different disciplines and different all universities having access to this sort of infrastructure. So it's happening in this country. Why is it there? And the four dot points I've listed there are just an extract from the report. Uh, it's just saying in, in general terms why this is important. And it, I'm just highlighting it because I want you to be familiar with the fact that the government is out there and it's going to create resources for all universities to play in or play with uh, in such a way that it can enhance the national research effort, not just the research effort of a few universities. You need to be aware of that opportunity. Likewise, I, I've inserted this reference from the same report and that is that in so, it says in some instances it is more appropriate and cost effective for Australia to contribute to multinational facilities. So the Australian government is looking beyond Australia's borders to make sure that it can get access to research facilities which Australian researchers can use and they'll actually put money into the process of allowing you to use that infrastructure on a multinational basis. It's obviously competitive and that's why it's important that you A, aware of it and B, try and get yourselves into a competitive position to utilise that stuff. Now why is that important? Because it, it, it really does impinge on the mindset of university staff to collaborate with others either in the RUN network or beyond the RUN network. Because the best way to increase the research productivity and aspirational uh, achievements of these universities is to work with other universities that have leverage into these systems already. So you need collaboration in order to be able to do that. And finally on this little section here, I just wanted to emphasise once again how important the OECD, and that is the world's greatest economies coming together under this organisational umbrella, what they're saying about economic growth and one of the elements here, apart from macroeconomic policy, trade, investment, financial regulation, is science, technology and innovation. Now I don't want to dwell on science and technology as in the same way here because there are other so forms of innovation in social sciences, humanities and so on, which are equally relevant to this exercise. But what I wanted to emphasise is that lifting economic performance is actually driven by and can capitalise on the innovation which is going on in research in the different environments in which it takes place. And the Regional Universities Network needs to appreciate that it has something to contribute uh, to this scene internationally. I won't um, dwell on this uh, simply because 
the policy settings in that document comment on facilitating technology transfer uh, by making the benefits of new technologies widely and rapidly available, promoting research and innovation to meet global and social challenges, and strengthening global cooperation and improving international governance. All of those three dot points are all about people working together more so than they perhaps have done in the past. For you thinking about collaboration amongst RUN universities, you should also be thinking about collaboration with other universities in the Australian sector for your advantage and their advantage, but you should also be thinking globally because the world is thinking globally about what it can do to improve economic circumstances across the globe. It all depends on funding. In 2009-10, the budget included $8.58 billion for science innovation, an increase of 25%. This is the Powering Ideas report. And it was uh, as a result of the incoming government having reviewed the situation, and they put money into this area. What happened in other countries? And bear in mind, we're sort of delving into the global financial crisis at this point. France, in the middle of all of that, put 260 million euros into research infrastructure. Where did we put it? Pink bats? School halls, so on, okay. The French took a different tack. They pumped money into research infrastructure to give the stimulus to, the, to their economy at the time. Now, to be fair, I should, I should emphasize the previous slide. 8.5 billion had gone into research and innovation in, the, in that budget also. What happened in the French situation was this was the allocation. I don't want to depress you with the numbers of euros here, but these are euros in billions. <coughs> 11 into higher education, 8 into research, industry and so on. You can see the spread of that money, of where the French government um, pumped their money uh, in that critical time in their economy uh, in the global financial crisis. So <coughs> increase in expenditure in research internationally. What did the UK do? Well, they had to cut everything. <laughs> when the new government came in, they just had to cut everything, but they saved uh, UK science from the deepest cuts. Made it, it was still difficult, but they at least didn't cut science because they believe that innovation is important to their economic uh, development and growth. In the United States, again, depressing set of numbers. $3 billion for the National Science Foundation, $10.4 billion for the National Institutes of Health, and so on. So that there was a response at that time uh, by putting money into these organizations to support research and development and innovation during a difficult economic period. So we need to be aware that that's what's been happening internationally. What's the future hold? Well, the uh, Royal Society published the document looking at the 21st century, uh, and they've looked at what are the predictions in terms of expenditure in R&D in selected countries. The top line, the red line, is the United States, and then you can see the China line coming up. The expenditure in China is likely to go up and follow that trend. The other countries listed there, it's increasing, but at a lower rate. Uh, nevertheless, it's increasing. Uh, so we need to be just on the ball here in terms of what's Australia's position. Uh, and at the present time, it's not looking all that great. And we've heard all, we keep hearing the talk about the next budget and getting back into surplus and what that's going to require because their income has come down a bit. Therefore, they're going to have to stop spending, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw what happened last year when there was a rumor, a rumor of the cuts to the NHMRC and people got out on the streets and they didn't eventuate. The cuts didn't eventuate. But nevertheless, the forward estimates are showing the dotted line at the top here of the growth in NHMRC funding over the period, the first period when I was CEO and then the second period when I was not CEO. Um, so this has been a period of 10 years. It's about to end in less than five minutes. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> so 10 years of growth in the NHMRC, but it's now flat. So there's a critical question in here for me, and that is, this is the number, shows you the number of applications to the NHMRC over that same period, 2000 to 2011. 
I won't go into the details of that, but the top line here just is a straight line through the growth in numbers of applications. This is numbers of people, numbers of applications going into the system, and the funded grants are at the lo lower level. Why is there a difference? Simply because there's been a growth in costs in research and growth in size of the grants that are awarded. So the doubling of funding twice over 10 years is being absorbed by increasing costs and increasing size of grants. There's been a slight increase in the number of grants funded and a significant increase, but nevertheless it's a difficult situation. What lies ahead? Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens now in terms of the money flattening off. Are the application numbers still going to increase? Where are the drivers? The drivers are in Category 1 grants that you need to get to drive the income to the institution. So people are going to keep trying in this system and it's going to become more and more difficult. And how do you win in a more and more difficult environment? In my view, collaborate. Work with others. Where you don't have a track record in these schemes, you need to find somebody who you can work with who does have a track record because track record is absolutely important. It's either publications and or grants from those funding bodies that you need to be able to work with others uh, to secure that sort of funding. How tight is it? Well, these are data from an unidentified university showing the scores from the NHMRC versus, the number versus applications in ranked order. And the little green line shows you the boundary between on the left the ones that were funded, on the right the ones that weren't. And that boundary is extremely tight. It just happens to be on the very tight upward swing of the bell curve of distribution of grants. Uh, and it's very difficult for the NHMRC, but it's also very difficult for the applicants because so many of them miss out on funding. I won't dwell on that unless you want to ask some questions later. Okay, moving on to regulation. Many of you are aware of the high costs and high requirements of regulation within your university to answer questions, fill in forms, do all that. And part of that is generated out of the Australian National Audit Office whose role is to make sure that there's scrutiny over the expenditure of taxpayers' dollars. And they have seven key principles for grants administration and the ARC and the NHMRC are obliged to respond to these sorts of seven points. And they have to do that, and the way that they have to do that is by collecting data. That's why their forms are so complicated and why it's so time-consuming to, to make an application and to deal with those sorts of um, grants. So th there's a higher level of regulation in the system. That's the take-home point I want you to, to get hold of here. And that's unlikely to diminish, I have to say. <coughs> there's the issue of ethics in research and the regulation which sits in behind that. You have to meet uh, ethical principles, you have to meet the guidelines, you have to comply on human research, obviously, and also animal research, obviously. Uh, and these are not easy things, and they, but they are absolutely crucial because if the system breaks down, there's a loss of faith in research by the general public. The politicians get upset about that because they lose their ability to use taxpayers' dollars to fund research. So it's an obligation on everyone to make sure that you make sure that the ethical constraints of the research are dealt with and handled appropriately through your institution. The difficulty here that I've highlighted is the fact that sometimes you might have anywhere up to 50 institutions collaborating on a human research ethics protocol and currently you need 50 sets of approval. And they're working on a system to try and condense that back so that you can get a fewer number of ethical approvals to make that collaborative activity work. What's the stumbling block here? Is that each institution has its responsibility to its staff under its enterprise agreement. Because if you breach the ethical protocols, it could lead to dismissal. So you're going to rely on ethical protocol that's been approved by another institution to dismiss your staff member? Interesting little issue of governance and administration in there, which I won't go into. In the United States, there is an of Office of Science and Technology Policy and institutions had to report, or still have to report, oh, I don't know what's happened here. The five minutes is up. Yeah. Can you just go back to the computer? Okay. It means that you're not being recorded anymore. Terrific. Now, go on here. <coughs> Room computer.
not doing anything there. Conference override, is that going to do it? No, that's the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> Interesting. While we're pausing on this, any questions so far? <laughs> about the regional universities network this morning and we've heard about some of the um, the innovation that comes out of being on the market. Oh, this is Joe here. Yeah, I'm in the council room. Right? The a benefit recording of chronically underfunding us as a nation. And it's sort of squeezing more out of us than we would if we'd be going to have had a second one. Sorry, I'm just, I'm not quite following. Can you summarise for me? Yeah. Okay. So, is there, um, a, I guess, a, um, a, a contradictory view to us seeking more and more money as a nation for research? And um, could, that, <coughs> could it be argued that yes, investing that. in us further and further everything, in terms of research down. dollars won't necessarily um, uh, coincide with a equivalent um, output in yeah, the research for This is a fundamental question for government. How much money do you put into R&D? Yes. And I, I think that the way in which governments look at that is that they look at comparator nations mm. and they just see where others are placed because governments will be competing one against the other to get economic development. They want the best for their country. Um, they want stimulus happening in their country. They want growth to better have a better lifestyle and so on. Uh, and so they'll make decisions on the balance of what they want to do. Uh, and it's interesting that countries like the Scandinavian countries have pumped a lot more into R&D and you saw the earlier slides and all the implications that flow from that. Um, USA pumps a lot of money in but it's got a bigger volume of, of um, capacity if you like that it, that it yes, wants that to support and the economy is booming as a result. Um, so I think okay. that there are a whole lot of issues in there and for the Australian government they've got to balance all sorts of things uh, at the moment and I don't see them shifting the balance um, I think the outcry if they cut R&D expenditure, the outcry would be just enormous, politically dangerous. Um, but whether they can afford to increase it or not, I don't see that either. So at the moment I think we're on status quo in terms of those sorts of issues. But if the economy sh starts to shift away from coal and iron ore, as I said earlier, uh, or if there are challenges in either in the environment for unforeseen things at the moment, or food security or water security, those sorts of things, which are going to create huge issues in social yeah. disruption, uh, you'll see more money going into innovation. And I think they look over the horizon. I think they're looking for those issues emerging uh, and that that will drive whether they find there is a need to put more expenditure in or not. So I guess that was the second question I was going to ask you, which was do you think um, I, I teach environmental science, so that's sort of, mm -hmm. I've been exploring these issues with students. Do you think that we are going to get to a point in Australia over the next few years where um, perhaps there will be a shift in energy dependency in other countries that leads to us um, not being able to make so much money out of digging stuff out of the ground, and hence Australia as a nation will be left staring at their hands in terms of R&D, or do you think that we'll actually get um, Look, I think there is a shift there, but I think it's a fair way off yet. Mm. I mean, I think it's obviously 10, at least 10 or 15 years away. But my point is that it, how long does it take to train a PhD to get to your status? And how long have you been in the research game to get the experience to be an early career researcher? Now, you've been in it quite some years. And to be at the top of your game in terms of the competitive nature of what's going on in the Australian research scene at the moment, it's going to take a few more years yet. Uh, before you are actually fully capacity, full capacity productive in terms of research and R&D outcomes. Mm -hmm. And there are some big questions around and you've got to play with others in terms of your space uh, to answer those big questions. So it takes a long time to develop researchers into that framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the Australian government needs to be looking ahead mm -hmm. to that scenario and making some pretty bold predictions as mm -hmm. to what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just one final question. We've got another elephant in the room, and that is our very, very rapidly ageing population of researchers mm. in Australia. Mm. I was going to come to workforce. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But ask the question anyway, because no, we're still not up there. I, I, I was just going to say, he, um, <coughs> he has started the recording again, so to get back to your slides, you need to do what you did earlier. <laughs> Can't remember.
What did I need to do? Um, I don't know. You spoke to them, so I don't know. What oh, yeah. Option. Uh, here we go. There you go. Oh, now okay, you need to do, do this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, can we just park yes, that for a moment? Yeah. Okay. We'll just push on. Okay. I've mentioned that workforce. Timely question. <laughs> <laughs> OECD has, been, OECD has been looking at the issue of workforce because this is something which is critical around the world at the moment. There's a global com competition for people who are skilled in research. Okay? Every country is worried about it. And there's been a report from ASA, Australian Council for Education Research, uh, on the supply, demand and characteristics of the higher degree by research population in Australia. And Senator Kim Carr, when he was minister in 2009, said the quote which I've put on that slide. The single most important re prerequisite for innovation is skilled people. So that's why universities are interested in training research. That's why they're interested in having research on their campuses and that's why they're interested in training research people. So it's critical. And the Access Economics people produced a report and then there was a government response and, and an our government policy and I've just summarised here, taken an extract from it. In the, the report identifies where we, would be, where we would benefit from improved performance. Um, and there are five dot points there, you can see. And they're all related to how we need to improve performance in training young people into research and developing people who are already in research into research careers. And that's what this meeting's all about. It's been recognised by government and the government has advertised its current and future priorities in this space. And you, under the five things across the top, you can see a whole range of different strategies which the government wants to support. How will they support them? In what way? I then go to the next slide. <laughs> <coughs> and this is the, this was a quote from the Australian newspaper just after that report was released. Vice Chancellor's cool on the research paper. Why were they cool? Because it was a report and there was no money attached. And what? Yep. It, it, it's really an aspirational document uh, and it's, as Caroline has said, it, it's within no f with, with no funding attached to this that there just needs to be a redirection of priorities both within institutions, between institutions and from government to institution and they can drive that through the indicators that they use in the block grant funding system. So there's RTS changes, there's changes in other aspects and they're all, they all fit within this envelope here. <laughs> I'm wondering where the recognition is given towards trying to switch our um, future workforce currently in our school system from performance based education to education that's based around people understanding what it means to innovate, how you actually innovate and gaining experiences through their education program in looking at what are we, I mean, and problem solving that has meaning for them. So actually looking at, for example, um, how can we make our school environment more productive and, and more enjoyable for us to work with, for example. You know, where's the recognition that's given to that, rather than waiting till we get to university and start talking about research skills training? And we're still talking about research training as if we are objects on a sausage machine. Mm. Look, I, I think that the way I would see this document, it, it is laying the plan, but it's really asking institutions such as the universities to look at that question and adopt strategies of their own to address that issue. Okay, so if you want to have a strong research workforce coming through into your university, you need to go back to that part of the education system and, and excite people about research and excite people about innovation and, and what it means. And what you've got to do is have the right sort of communicators who can go back into the schools 
and turn turn the switches on in those kids that that have the capacity to come through and to get interested. And even and if we only do it within our own area of remit, that is, if you go back and look within the schools that we all teach and research in, and say, how much do our kids actually get to innovate, and how much are we just yeah. pouring knowledge into their heads in the same way we've done for thousands of years? <coughs> challenge is not to say it's all those guys in the school system they should be doing it I think the question is with you what can I do tomorrow yeah. in my area that I have control over to make that happen to be fair, I think this report is not directed at that issue as much as it is in taking the cohort of people who come into universities into that re research environment who start off into a PhD and what do we do to keep them? And it's the mobility issue that you refer to, it's the career structure thing that you refer to. I mean the career structure thing is, in my view, um, I'm, I hesitate to use the word diabolical but I think it's almost approaching that in context of people who have to keep reapplying for their salaries every three to five years uh, in a research environment where research takes a longer time. And I, I don't know how to answer that question. We just better move on. Um, I was just struck by the immediacy of the response of Vice-Chancellors uh, at the time about there's no money. Um, but then soon after, and I think the dates here are shown, April 20 at uh, 2011, followed by April 27, 2011, Kim Carr came out in the press to re-emphasise the fact that the Australian government was actually serious about research and had put money into the system. Uh, so there was a political response to the political question which was raised uh, in response to this issue. Which brings me on to the political environment. Now, there's a lot of information out there in terms of what governments are, how governments are dealing with the issues that arise here, and they are generally uh, looking for priorities. They're looking to, uh, in some ways, try and direct the research effort, uh, but without a hands-on approach. And so the way they do that is develop national priorities for research. And then we had the National Innovation Priorities from the Cutler Review as well. Now, I don't know if you can see all of this, but across the top are the five uh, research priorities as they currently are formed. Uh, an environmental sustainable, environmentally sustainable Australia, promoting and maintaining good health, understanding cultures and communities, safeguarding Australia and frontier technologies. Now, you're probably all familiar with those. Uh, and then there are various capability areas which have been identified down the left and you can see the intersection between all of those things. Now, the way in which these priorities come to the fore is that you have to tick these boxes when you're applying for funding from the ARC or NHMRC and some of the subcategory boxes that fit underneath all of those. And so people do look at the way in which your research is fitting into the priorities that have been set for the nation and, and some of the finer detail priorities that are available. So these things are relevant, but it, in, and they, they're actually currently being reviewed so that there's a whole review process going on about the national research priorities. And my problem with those priorities is how broad they are. Mm. I mean, they're almost catch-alls mm. uh, because if you, you can slot most things into each of those priorities. Mm. And I, I'm just troubled a little bit by that exercise. But it's happening around the world. Other people are doing it as well as Australia. Just returning to research block grants and politics in here, we know that compacts and ERA are feeding into the sustainable research excellence category. And Caroline uh, mentioned that earlier th this morning. Um, and because she's mentioned it, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but SRE is quite a complex exercise, involves staff hour surveys, indirect costs of research, um, all that sort of data gathering stuff, uh, very formulaic process and there are thresholds which have to be exceeded and all the rest of it. Quite complex. But in fact, he's dealing with a very small amount of money, relatively speaking, across the whole. I think block grants account for $1.5 billion of expenditure and SRE adds up and the last figure that's in my head is $82 million. It's actually, it was increasing year on year, yeah. so when it uh, plateaus out in 2013, it would be about $200 million. Yeah. 
So spread across 40 universities, you can do the maths, you know, <laughs> it's not much. So what behaviour is it going to change? That's the question I ask. And so I think there's got to be a bit of an examination of the whole block grant system, to be, to be fair. Now, OECD again, a publication through that organisation. I want you to understand that performance-based funding mechanisms as operating in Australia are not unknown around the world. Some of them have been operating like this for some time. And this is an interesting quote. The rationale for performance funding is that funds should flow to institutions where performance is manifest. Performing institutions should receive more income than lesser performing institutions, which would provide performers with a competitive edge and would stimulate less performing institutions to perform. Output should be rewarded, not input. So that's a quote from Herbst. Um, but that's the quote that which is included in this OEC document. So. Um, it's a, it's a theme which has been around, as I say, and this is a list of countries who have something like a formula uh, performance-based system, UK, Spain, the Slovak Republic, Hong Kong, Australia has been there from the composite index days of 1995, and now with the ERA, uh, Poland, Italy, New Zealand, Belgium, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland. All of those countries are using uh, performance-based funding mechanisms. And it's interesting, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Belgium. Didn't I highlight those earlier? In terms of where they sit in the global scene in terms of R&D around the world. I just wanted to talk briefly about mission-based compacts. And I know Caroline was obviously very closely involved in this exercise and sat across the table from certain universities uh, when they were discussing these. And I said to her, I hope I mentioned to you last night, I have a somewhat cynical view about these things. I did. Um, and the reason is, let me just go through it quickly and I just want to highlight a few things. The purpose of the compact is to provide a strategic framework for the relationship with the common, between the Commonwealth and the University. For higher education research, research training, innovation, the Commonwealth's ambitions include those four dot points. Progressively increasing the number of research groups performing at world class levels, etc. Boosting research collaboration. This is what the university, this is what the government is expecting of the universities. So your universities have been responding to this because funding and accountability is tied to this through the compact agreement with the Commonwealth. Let's go into, how many of you know what's in the compact? Have you heard of them? You have heard of them? Were you involved in them? Okay, let me just tell you about these things. <coughs> So in part three, uh, so you're asked to put forward strategies in which you're going to increase the number of research groups performing at world class levels, promoting collaboration between researchers to improve research performance. You have to explain in the compact document what you're going to do. Uh, you have to, have to explain how you're going to build areas performing at world standard as evaluated by ERA, improve performance in areas which did not perform at world standard as evalu evaluated by ERA, etc. What are you going to do? What's your strategy? Develop research capacity in areas of strategic importance. What are you going to do? <laughs> okay. Not to exceed two pages. You have to put in the baseline figures and you have to issue target numbers for the number of disciplines as defined by two digit fields of research performing at world standard or above. Three, four or five. You have to target a number for 2013. Principal performance indicators required. Category 1 income. What's your progressive target in 11, 12 and your target in 13? How much money are you going to bring into the system? Or how much bring are you going to get from the system into your university? What's the number of joint research grants and jointly supervised PhD students? I think this, this is really quite important in the context of how are your universities responding to these questions being asked by the Commonwealth and what are the targets that have been set and can you meet them? What happens if you don't meet them? That's an unanswered question. Mm -hmm. Research training, university strategies, uh, these are examples. Again, the response should not exceed two pages in length. Is this a public available two pages? No, well, these are confidential well, documents well, to the Commonwealth. Thank you. 
things to see, but from the point of view of the government, to see how universities were planning their progress. We didn't say this is good or bad, we just have to show what we want to do that process. Okay, so, but nevertheless, these are signed off documents. Uh, and people will be interested when they're publicly available to have a look and see what the aspirations are and questions about them. Do you reckon if we added up all the Category 1 income that was aspired to, how many times <laughs> would it exceed the available money? <coughs> three or four times. Yeah. <laughs> so that means, broadly speaking, everyone will vote. Broadly speaking. Well, And I, th I think the value out of this whole compact exercise is actually getting universities to think about these things and to identify what strategies they really are going to play with and whether those strategies are realistic or not. They have to really work hard to identify that. And so my interest is in really looking at um, how realistic are they and B, um, what's the outcome going to be at the time when that has to be assessed. So um, just moving on. Research standards is an area of the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, TEXA. I find this a fascinating area and because I just don't know what are the research standards going to be. How are they going to be defined and I have yet to find an answer. I keep looking on the website but I've not seen anything yet. Um, and I think this is an interesting area for policy uh, down the track. Um, and what is TEXA going to do about its legislated responsibility in the area of research standards? What are they going to be looking for? And you can see here they're going to be looking at the Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research. Well, is that a research standard? So we'll see. Politics. This was recent, uh, March 28 this year. Push for industry vouchers to put research where it matters. And I put this in because there are three early career researchers here and why they've posed them in front of a graffiti <laughs> scrambled wall, um, I'm not really sure. Um, I thought it was a bit typecasting, wasn't it? Anyway, this youth-led think tank, Left Right, is advocating a radical overhaul of research linkage grants um, so that they should be vouchers given to industry and the industry comes back to the university and spends their money, spends that money in the university when the university has to respond to what the industry wants in terms of research, R&D. An interesting idea, mm -hmm. but it's not the first one. We have the Cooperative Research Centres program which does exactly that. You don't get money from, a CR from the CRC program unless you've got industry money and the ratios are right. And that is that there's more money coming in from the industry and other partners than you might get from the Commonwealth, or at least it's going to be 50-50. So the program is not so innovative in that sense, but it is innovative certainly for the linkage, ARC linkage program. But this is a discussion which is now current and out there, and you need to be aware that these sorts of things are, are going on in discussion. My final comment on politics. You'll remember that Tony Abbott took a swing at the climate scientists um, about his understanding of what they were saying, and then the economists came along and <laughs> And here is the response. So I found this, but I, there's a serious issue here. And that is, it's the intersection between politics and research. And the outcomes of that, and the ability of people to communicate it to people so that it could be understood, and so that it can be accepted, and that we move on with it. Uh, and to take swings and, and just ignore it, or make worse comments about it, I think is, is quite unfortunate and I think it's something which we have to take care of as academics and as researchers. We need to be responsive to these sorts of things. So a few final points. First of all, networks are, I think are important. Collaboration, sharing, joint priorities and the old cliche that it's got to be greater than the sum of the parts. And you have an opportunity to start something really interesting here as far as regional uh, is concerned. You've got to develop critical mass. I won't go into the definition of critical mass in the physical term because it ends up with an explosion. 
but you know what we mean by having critical mass. And you can only do that in this group of small universities with small capacity. You can only do it by being in there together, in my view. Mentoring and development, absolutely important. And you should be, as individuals, you should be seeking, seeking out mentoring opportunities. And your university should be seeking out those opportunities for you. And your network is a great way of improving that mentoring capacity across your set of universities. Because mentoring, now that I'm into it, in a much better way than I ever did before, in terms of working with individual researchers on their research grant applications, for example, uh, it's been rewarding for me and fascinating. And I'm learning a lot about science by doing it. And that's my reward. But I'm hopefully helping other people think about their, their experiments, their logic, and how they write it and communicate it. And that's very important. So seek out those opportunities. Make sure that you have linkage with stakeholders. And what this means is the research that you undertake should be linked to some real world outcomes out there. So if you're into the social sciences, you should be talking with the local regional experts and people in state governments and local governments about what are the policy imperatives for them in terms of delivering for their society and how can you help them. It doesn't hurt to go out and say, what are the big questions that you can't answer? Can we help you with that? And if you go and approach them about it, rather than waiting for them to come to you because they don't really know how to approach you, you should be forceful and go out and approach them. Linkage with stakeholders is important. Participate in the system. This is advice I would give to any young person. If you get the opportunity to participate in the system, either being a referee or being an assessor on a research grant application, or writing a report on something, or doing something beyond your own activity, doing something for somebody else in the system, then please do it. The reason? Because you become known in a wider set of people, and that is so crucial to your credibility as a researcher, and, and the way in which you're perceived as a researcher, and you'd be surprised how that influences the way people think about what you do. Because you're making a contribution above and beyond, as it were, and you'll get rewarded for that. You'll find that it will have a subtle impact on the way in which things come to you rather than you having to ask for them all the time. Keep an eye on the bigger picture. You have your own focus on your own research activity, but make sure you understand how that sits within the wider field of your own research area and how that wider area fits within the bigger scope of things that are going on around you and be prepared to change. Be prepared to change your direction in your research. Take up the opportunities that come. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, and as included in one of those um, human resource slides, be prepared to move. Be mobile. And we heard earlier about the opportunity for um, placements in other universities in this network over a period of time. That's going to disrupt your life but that disruption to your life might be very rewarding for subsequent years if you get that opportunity to travel, to work somewhere else, to work with other people and to learn from them and to gain that experience and bring it back home, that will be very valuable to you. And I think the network has an opportunity to assist you with that. But it costs money. But there are ways in which you can find money to do that. So we're open for discussion. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank <clears throat> you.